Lord, you fasted for 40 days and 40 nights for our justification. Give to us that kind of discipline. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in chapter 3 of Dermot McCulloch's Thomas Cranmer on the campaign to end the marriage from 1527 to 1533. We've had the trip of Cromwell or Cranmer to Rome. We've also found out that <clears throat> there's already been a lot of heavier duty research leading up to the 1529 Blackfriars tra trial that ended up uh, sabotage by Campeggio. But also that Cranmer had his hands in uh, this pre-existing research. And that there were four publications by 1531 summarizing all of this activity. So by the time Cranmer goes to the imperial court in 1532, he's well armed. That's sort of the upshots. At the end of July 1531, Grenaeus had bullionly wrote to Busser from Basel about his English trip. We met Grenaeus, who had been in England in 1531 and made contacts with Cranmer, Latimer. The inner Tunstall, the inner circle of Moore, and maybe even had an interview with Henry. And uh, he sees the rebellious approach to the English church, and he sees possibilities for the, the Reformation in England. So now he's writing a booster. He spoke of the king's genuine agonies of conscience, partly described to him by Thomas More as Lord Chancellor, and the inevitability that Henry would go ahead with the new marriage, regardless of what learned men's opinions were. He stressed the tense political state of England and Henry's moves during the spring against papal power. Again, this is all very early, but from one standpoint, 1533 hasn't happened, but the wheels are turning, which made comment by reformers an urgent matter. He has removed all the power of the Pope from the realm, close quote. Grenaeus went on to claim that he had contacts with an influential sympathizer in the king's inner circle. Since Henry also appropriates power in a written book, how easily you might have believed that he could be urged on in his chamber where he is an intimate servant, a most learned man sufficiently of our school to these changes. Is that Cranmer? For the moment, the situation in England remained too delicate for the certainty of such a mo movement in royal policy. The f influential figure at court remains unnamed, but he kept recurring in the correspondence over the next few months as Grenaeus frenetically tried to orchestrate a coherent evangelical response to the king's problem. In early September, this would be 1531, while preparing the first of what would turn to be out to be two supplementary missions to England by his servant Thomas, Grenaeus reassures ministers of Strasbourg about sending their interim discussions to Henry, because nothing is revealed in public before this king tells one particular man who is, Wolsey has fallen. Is it Cromwell? Is it Cranmer? In a follow-up letter the same day, he told them that he changed tack and had only sent on his own manuscript since this particular man was due to be sent to Strasbourg to understand the matter from you in person. 
Bilcher was still anticipating this visit of an important man suitable for the purpose when he wrote Grenaeus on 9 October and in the course of hectoring an unhappy letter to Bucer on 21 October 1531. For the first time, Grenaeus casually mentions the mysterious figure Cronmaris, footnote 72. Uh, that's very interesting, Cron Maris. Cranmer was by now a key man in the negotiations as far as Grenaeus was concerned. He confidently and eagerly anticipated Cranmer's mission abroad. That's interesting. So it was being planned clearly in 1531 which had apparently been discussed already when Grenaeus, when it was in England. He himself had vehemently encouraged a mission by this trustworthy man, rather than leaving the English to place faith simply in his own words. Grenaeus had sent over to Cranmer news of the unpromising pronouncements of Luther and Melanchthon by that man of Cologne, possibly a coded reference to the Lutheran envoy, the disguised English ex-friar Robert Barnes. You just note this, that man of Cologne, Robert Barnes. Here's Grenaeus, a letter to Booser on 21 October for the first time naming Cranmer. The bulk of the letter is in a clerk's hand. Robert Barnes. Barnes left Wittenberg. Left Wittenberg with a letter of Luther's at the beginning of September 1531. And it seemed strange if two missions involving Wittenberg were going on in peril with no mention of the other. Barnes dressed as a merchant on his English visit. Previously, in October, Grenace referred to Qui Quivis Coloniensis Mercator. However, Grenace could equally rever be referring to Colon born virgin Christoph Mont, who entered Cromwell's service, 1530 31. Moreover, by 21 October, Booser had taken the first step in the correspondence with Cranmer that would bear much fruit later. Grenaeus was worried in case your or my life's writing to Cranmer might have complicated progress. However, there were to be worse troubles for this than Grenaeus' plan. From the beginning, opinions differed about the success of his English mission. Oikola Claudius congratulated Grenaeus in July 1531 on how well he had done, but Erasmus was furious that Grenaeus used his visit to promote the evangelical cause and a permanent rift between the two scholars developed. <clears throat> no doubt the doyen of humanists was worried that his own reputation in England was threatened by Grenaeus' undiplomatic enthusiasm, undiplomatic enthusiasm, endangering the links with English friends, which had taken more than three decades to build up. Worse still than the impression which Grenaeus must have left with some conservative England's was the fragmented and unsatisfactory response from the leaders of the Continental Reformations. Henry's hopes had been raised in vain about the Aragon annulment. From the moment that the king's great matter had become pub public knowledge, Luther had been sympathetic in the plight of Catherine of Aragon whose treatment confirmed his already low opinion of Henry VIII. 
This, combined with his deep antipathy to divorce in general, made him advocate the drastic course of bigamy for the king. Melanchthon bizarrely added the suggestion that Henry should legitimize his bigamy with a papal dispensation, an object lesson in the flu fluidity of confessional lines in the early Reformation. There were Lutheran responses which Richard Barnes presented to the king in December 1531. The Swiss leaders, Wingley and Oikel and Pottius, were more sympathetic to Henry's arguments. But alas, for the... Is it but alas, for themselves and for any immediate links between England and Switzerland, Zurich's military disaster in autumn 1531 left Zwingli a corpse on the battlefield at Capel and Oikolampadius a broken man, terminally ill. Booser, ever the mediator and lover of nuanced arguments, was at first inclined to think Henry's first marriage null and void like the Swiss, but he moved towards the Lutheran position once he'd seen their documents, much to Grinius's Grinius's annoyance. In a letter to Grinius on 30 December 1531, Boswell and his stress Strasbourg colleagues finally came out as rejecting the arguments of the censuri. But in the course of a dissertation of sadistically Busserian prolixity, they added in pragmatic fashion that what mattered was what the magistrate felt politic. Henry should get what he wanted so long as he did not humiliate Catherine. This was no answer to fit for the king's righteous agonies of conscience. Henry, scandalized at the monstrousness of bigamy, was no more sympathetic to reformers suggesting it in 1531 than when in desperation the Pope had raised the same idea the year before. And Barnes' mission to the English court in December got a boisterously hostile reception. So Hanmer must have met Barnes in all of this in 1531. And I've known something about Barnes and his movements and Luther trying to pin all that down where he is theologically remains so elusive. Grinius was appalled when he read the Strasbourg document in January 1532, correctly anticipating that it would only make things worse in England, and he expressed his feelings forcibly to Booser. All Grinius's efforts, indeed the four separate English missions, which he, his servant, and Robert Barnes had undertaken throughout 1531, had produced no use, useful result for either the great matter or for the evangelical cause. Yet Grinius had created a link between Thomas Cranmer and the reformers of Strasbourg, and that would never be broken. Right up to 1547, Martin Busser was the continental figure most consistently sympathetic with the problems of Henrician England, and he was repeatedly instrumental in pursuing alliances with Henry when all fellow reformers despaired of the murderously eccentric monarch. The Strasbourg connection provided another enduring relationship for Cranmer. Among Grinius's other correspondence was a cultivated that enthusiastically evangelical Dutch printer based in Strasbourg, Reiner Wolf. Cranmer was probably responsible for bringing Wolf to England once he became Archbishop. 
Wolf played a major role both in acting as an English agent abroad during Henry's reign and printing Cranmer's books under Edward VI. He also proved a true friend to Cranmer and his family in their time of disaster under Mary. Footnote 79. Thanks to Grinius too, the Swiss reformers had established a personal tie with Cranmer, which they began exploiting in the mid-1530s. In August 1533, Grinius required of Bucer, who had succeeded, succeeded Warham as Archbishop of Grinius, inquired of Bucer, In August 1533, Grenasse inquired of Bucer, who had succeeded Warham as Archbishop of Canterbury. One can imagine his delight at the news that it was Cranmer. The result was his 1534 Plutarch dedication to the Archbishop. And it cannot be coincidence that at the same time, Grenasse's publisher, John Brable, also sent copy of Polydor Virgil's Anglia Historia. Erasmus even reported in November 1533 that Grenaeus was trying to get a pension out of Cranmer, something which horrified the aged reformer, aged humanist, since he had come to regard Grenaeus as an evangelical loudmouth while still fondly believing that the Archbishop was sound in religious matters. Even though Cranmer viewed Esconce, the Eucharistic view of the Swiss until the very end of Henry's reign, in the influence mediated through Bucer, turned his thought away from Lutheran modes of thought and these permanently marked the Church of England. We will call that to a close at this point. Godspeed.